Hello and welcome back to the channel. You've joined myself, Dr. James Gill, for another clinical skills video. Today we're going to be doing a deep dive into the carpal tunnel examination and actually what goes on when somebody has carpal tunnel syndrome. So in order to grasp um, what we've done in our carpal tunnel syndrome demonstration, which you should be able to see our previous video over there, um, we need to have a look at the anatomy. So the carpal tunnel is a passageway in the wrist that allows connection between the forearm and the hand. And it's called the carpal tunnel because it's comprised on the base of the carpal bones. And across the top of it, we've got something called the flexor retinaculum, uh, a thick fibrous sheath that essentially stops everything inside from bowing out when the hand moves. And it's called the carpal tunnel because the carpal bones say, make them the largest proportion of this tunnel. The flexor retinaculum over the top connects at four anchorage sites to the carpal bones. So when it comes to uh, the carpal tunnel, um, we have the carpal bones forming the base. Across the top is the flexor retinaculum, and that's held on in four positions. We've got the uh, scaphoid, the pisiform, the hook of the hamate, and the trapezium at the base of the thumb. These form the anchors for uh, the flexor retinaculum over the top. And I've kind of worked that one backwards, thinking that the flexor retinaculum is a trapezium-shaped uh, um, bit of tissue, um, and that just helps me anchor where my first anchor point is, and then move on round from there. Um, once we've grasped where the carpal uh, tunnel is, we need to understand why it's important. So if we have a look at the uh, flexor retinaculum here, covering over the carpal tunnel, it gives us an idea of the contents. So we have eight tendons from uh, the flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus. They're involved in uh, flexing uh, the uh, fingers at the metacarpal pharyngeal joints and also flexing at the interphalangeal joints. The other um, uh, ligament that we have running through there is the ligament to flexus pollicis longus. And the crucial bit um, within the carpal tunnel um, is the median nerve. The median nerve will supply sensation to the lateral uh, three and a half fingers. We say lateral because when we're standing in the anatomical position, obviously our index will be on the outside. So we've got the lateral three and a half fingers and the thumb. It's going to provide innovation to the thena eminence. And that's really, really crucial to explaining why patients have difficulties picking things up, doing buttons, and generally how carpal tunnel will have a huge impact on a patient's activities of daily living. So let's have a look at those muscles now. So with the carpal tunnel, we're obviously going to pay a lot of attention to the thena muscles it makes sense if we know what they're called. So in terms of these, we've got a little acronym FAO. So we're going to bring all issues with the, th uh, with the uh, median nerve, with the carpal tunnel, for attention of the thena eminence. So those muscles, very simply, are the uh, flexor pollicis brevis, the abductor pollicis brevis, the abductor, and then underneath that, we've got the opponent's pollicis brevis. If we have a flexor pollicis brevis, it makes sense that we have an extensor pollicis brevis. However, that is not contained within the carpal tunnel, so it's not something we need to be concerned about today. With regard to uh, the carpal tunnel, as we said, you can see um, the muscles of the thena eminence, and the median nerve is going to provide innovation there. Hence, if it's been squashed by arthritis or osteophytes or inflammation, or just general irritation, for example, working at a desk and repetitive strain injury, the median nerve compression will lead over time to wasting at the thena eminence, having a big impact on a patient's ability to move their thumb. And at the end of the day, we have to remember that our opposable thumbs are the things that allowed us to be the humans we are. So it's all very well and good understanding the names of the muscles, but to help us with that, we need to appreciate the movements of the thumb. So with the thumb in the same plane as the rest of the fingers, we can abduct the thumb and we can adduct the thumb. We can flex the thumb 
and we can extend the thumb. We can also bring it round in opposition and those muscles are going to do as they say. So it makes a lot more sense for you when you realise that the thumb is also called the pollicis. So flexor pollicis brevis will flex the thumb over. Abductor pollicis brevis will abduct the thumb, abduction going away. We'll also have opponent pollicis. Now that will oppose the pollicis, oppose the thumb. But it does need to work in concert with flexor pollicis brevis to bring the thumb around and over, as opposed to flexus pollicis brevis, just bringing the thumb down. Hopefully you can see there why a problem here at the carpal tunnel has a such significant impact on your ability to move and do things with the hand. It can often be a bit of a challenge for students to grasp the sensory distribution from the median nerve. However, if we look at the anatomy, it becomes very clear. So we have the median nerve coming out of uh, the carpal tunnel and it splits off to the thumb, the index, the middle, and we can literally follow it up here, half of uh, the uh, ring finger, whereas the other half of the ring finger is, is innervated by the ulnar nerve and is very much not part of the carpal tunnel, is not affected by uh, the flexor retinaculum there. So with that in mind, literally just seeing what it is that we're talking about often makes life an awful lot easier. And if you can keep the anatomy in mind, then you should be able to easily understand how the sensation changes when we have compression at the carpal tunnel here. Hence, when patients have paresthesia, pins and needles, numbness or pain, we're going to get the thumb, the index, the middle and half of the ring finger affected. There is an off-branching of the median nerve that comes out just before the flexor retinaculum. So it is possible that we can retain sensation at the base of the thumb when we do have carpal tunnel syndrome. Well, I hope that's been a, a good overview of carpal tunnel for you. Please consider subscribing and liking the channel because it tells the YouTube algorithm we're here and that might help other people to see this video. Please drop a comment down below on any other areas you'd like us to uh, look at focusing on. I think one of the things that seems to be coming through loud and clear is the temporal mandibular joint issues. So we're going to be trying to have a look at that in the next couple of weeks. With that in mind, take care. We'll see you in the next one. Cheerio.